All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us um, today. And uh, my name is Hadi, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Particular Software. Um, today, uh, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Mauro will uh, interview Neil um, from Stress Assessment Systems, uh, and uh, we'll talk about challenges of uh, building a real world distributed system. And uh, you'll hear some war stories. Um, so uh, very interesting. Um, uh, I'll just a, a quick housekeeping before we get things started. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, don't use the chat, use the uh, Q&A section so uh, uh, we can uh, notice your question and uh, we'll make sure we address them and answer them and towards the end. And um, yeah, um, without uh, further ado, um, let me um, um, ask uh, Mauro and uh, Neil um, to start. Thanks, Hadi, and welcome, Neil. And good day, everyone. And welcome to another particular webinar. So <laughs> it's interesting because I've been helping organization design their systems for the last uh, more or less 20 years now. And after having been involved uh, with the fashion and clothing industry, domain and industry with all the craziness around sizes, color, attributes of various genres and multiple SKUs for each item because reasons, right? And I thought that nothing could have been more complex. Then I, meet, then I met Neil and the team at Strass and they changed my mind because things can be more complex. And this is Mauro, as Adi said before, and today I have the pleasure to host Neil the Vice President of Development at Strass Assets and System. Welcome, Neil. Tell us something about Thanks, you. Thanks, Mauro. So um, I, I, I'll talk a little bit about you know, my company, uh, Strass Assessment Systems. So uh, for uh, around 20 years, um, we have provided solutions for the assessments industry. So typically, our clients, uh, they offer uh, education, certification, or licensure programs. And uh, the system that we should be talking about today is the one that we've built for one of our largest clients, the AICPA. Uh, so the AICPA, uh, they produce, deliver, and score the uniform CPA exam. And our enterprise solution for them includes content authoring of test questions, automated assembly of those questions into an exam, delivery into a test center, scoring, reporting, and invoicing. Uh, some of our other clients include AAMC, who offer the MCAT exam, uh, Intellios, who offer uh, sonography and physician certifications, uh, and NCCPA, who certify uh, physician assistants. Yeah, interesting. And the, 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 the more, the, even the more interesting thing is that I've been one of your customers probably because I, I had a few tests at uh, the test, different test centers. And uh, I know that one of those uh, is one of your customers. So I used your system and that's very cool. So that was a, a brief overview of uh, what Strass does and what the domain is about. And uh, can you now give us a brief overview of what are the technologies at play in, uh, yeah. in the system you're building? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, currently we are in the middle of a cloud migration effort. So our latest technology stack is uh, obviously a service bus. Uh, there's .NET Core, Azure Functions, uh, Azure Cosmos DB, Azure Service Bus, uh, Azure Cognitive Search, uh, Angular, TypeScript, and uh, Monorepo with NX. Um, uh, on the other hand, the CPA exam was computerized, I think, uh, in the early 2000s. So there are a lot of legacy technologies also into play. Um, and our on-prem stack uh, currently has uh, N-Service Bus, RabbitMQ, RavenDB, uh, SQL Server. Uh, we also use uh, IBM's uh, Cplex engine. Uh, so that actually uses linear programming and user-defined constraints uh, to automate the creation of the exam. So the CPA exam is actually assembled by this linear programming um, uh, kind of Cplex uh, engine. Uh, and over the years, we've had uh, kind of two or three opportunities uh, to make deep uh, design or technology changes for the AICPA. So one is when we overhaul the exam to be web-based instead of using desktop technologies. Uh, a second one is when we got rid of testing windows so that the candidates could test throughout the year. Uh, and so there are no blackout dates uh, at this point uh, with the CPA exam. And 
obviously the more recent one is the cloud migration effort that I was referring to. So I guess that gives you a sense of um, uh, all the technologies uh, currently in play. That, 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 that's interesting because there are a lot of um, technologies at play in this case uh, and which uh, makes things even more challenging, I guess. <laughs> it's not only Definitely the domain yes. that is complex, but it's also the, the, the overall amount of technologies involved. And uh, what were the reasons, uh, or if one, what was the reason for following SOA principles uh, and implementing a distributed architecture in, in your domain? Okay, so uh, let me share uh, my screen for this. Um, uh, so in order to discuss the need for SOA, uh, I think it's best to briefly look at uh, all the systems that are involved. Uh, and what we'll do is we will, um, uh, using some uh, examples, we'll look at uh, specific issues that we were facing. Uh, and um, we'll also look at one of the first services we extracted. Uh, so. I added this slide to give uh, um, uh, a high level view of how the CPA exam is actually administered by three separate organizations. So while the AICPA produces the exam and scores the results as shown by these red arrows, uh, the candidates, they actually register with state boards. Uh, so if you look at this first uh, green arrow, uh, that's the candidate registering for the exam. Uh, and when they give the exam, they do it in physical test centers uh, that are owned by another company called Prometric. So uh, our exam software actually runs in 400 Prometric test centers. And um, uh, what we do is we create a small uh, 5 to 10 MB of a RavenDB database per candidate. Uh, and then uh, this state file is then sent to uh, our backend system uh, where we score the candidates' responses and then we report their scores back to the state boards. So uh, if we are looking at just uh, from an AICPA perspective, you know, the systems that we built specifically for AICPA. Uh, so from left to right, uh, we uh, have the CMS system that is for content authoring. Uh, then there's the assembly system that creates the exam. Uh, the test delivery system is the one that the candidates actually interact with. Uh, and then the backend system scores the candidates responses. Uh, I'm also including a sample item uh, so in our industry, a test question is called an item. Uh, and an item can be as simple as a multiple choice question, uh, but it can also be more complex. And so uh, it can have, um, you know, exhibits, uh, reference materials, and a um, number of different ways to collect candidate responses. So in this example, these Excel-like grids that you're seeing, they actually capture uh, the candidate's responses. So um, we can talk about the need for SOA from a CMS system perspective. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the CP exam was computerized around 20 years ago. Uh, and if you look at the implementation, there is heavy use of NED framework and uh, business rules are typically in the presentation layer or in stored procedures. Uh, however, if you just look at it from an item perspective, the CMS system is responsible for more than the test question. Uh, it is also responsible for authoring of scoring rules uh, for managing the inventory, managing statistics, references, and classifications, amongst other things. So we don't have the time to get into each one of these, but I'll briefly describe what statistics are. So uh, the candidates who appear for the CP exam, they don't actually get a raw score. Instead, they get a scale score that kind of traces their performance on a bell curve. Uh, and this scale score is derived from stats associated with an item. So from a system perspective, while these are... Um, very separate business capabilities on their own. Technically, they are coupled for several reasons, one being the system UI, uh, another being reporting, then there are database constraints, views, store procedures. So uh, this kind of technical complexity increases the cost of change. Uh, and also you cannot optimize one business capability without affecting all the others. So uh, another example is that uh, for an item to be included in an item, it needs to be promoted from its initial state to a pretest state to an operational state. And as it is being promoted, several reviews need to occur. Uh, so these reviews were implemented globally across all the business capabilities and validation was performed globally across all the business capabilities as part of one large workflow. Uh, and so, as you can imagine that this can get uh, fairly complex uh, from an implementation perspective, and it would be nice if, you know, each 
business area had its own smaller review process and its own smaller workflow. Um, another example that I'll give uh, with the CMS system is that um, uh, candidates may request a rescore for an exam they took in the past if they believe that there was an error in their result processing. So when we rescore, the database must appear frozen in time. And our monolithic view of an item meant that we snapshot everything related to an item. Uh, so across all the business capabilities that I was talking about. And as you can imagine, creating the snapshot is of high technical complexity. And uh, only when we looked at this problem through a SOA lens, we realized that very little data actually needed to be snapshot. So um, in, in, in uh, overall, what I'm saying is that there is um, uh, some technical complexity that is unnecessary uh, that only got clarified as we started implementing uh, SOA. Um, another common issue that we had was duplication, and I will try to explain it through a feature called adaptive routing. Uh, so simply stated, adaptive routing is when a candidate is given a harder set of questions or an easier set of questions based on how they did with the previous set. Uh, and this scenario gets a little bit more complicated when the candidates who take exams over multiple days. And so uh, why don't, we don't have to get into the spec test. It can hopefully demonstrate the complexity involved. So these adaptive routing rules, they originate from the automated assembly process. Uh, they then need to be imported into our CMS system because that is the system of record. Uh, from here, they are exported and included in a content package that we send to test centers and the delivery system executes these rules for the live exams. And when the results come to our backend system, the backend system again executes these rules to ensure that the candidate had a fair experience. So you can see that the data schema and logic for adaptive routing is in every system and every system will need to change if we make a change to adaptive routing. Um, so from a SOA perspective, this would be simplified because only one service would own the data schema as well as behavior. Let me, let me interrupt you for a second. This is an interesting uh, uh, logical view. So there are, these are four main building blocks. Huh? That, that represent logical blocks in the, in the system. Going back for a second to the um, technolo technology, technologies at play we briefly touched on before. I imagine, well, I know, <laughs> but I imagine that uh, all these logical views uh, when deployed in production uh, are in very different systems and very different environments. Can you briefly uh, describe those? Uh? Yeah, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, so let's say the test delivery, right? So the test delivery is uh, we run in a VM in the Prometric Test Center on IIS. Uh, so um, uh, what we've done for um, that system uh, is um, uh, we don't have the infrastructure to run and service bus, you know. Uh, however, what we've done is um, we have uh, identified the different services that are involved. And then we have created components uh, from those services uh, that get deployed into the IS application uh, mm -hmm. as just you know um, regular .NET NuGet packages. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, there is messaging involved, but that messaging is really uh, it's a poor man service bus, you know that that we use uh, in uh, in the test delivery. Uh, once you know uh, there there are plans to possibly move the uh, driver to be uh, cloud-based. Uh, and so when that happens, uh, you will see uh, that it is in more in line with, uh, you know, uh, how they're doing uh, the rest of the enterprise. Uh, and so uh, the backend system is a good example of, you know, where uh, there is currently the full push of, you know, using um, uh, the cloud native technologies. Mm -hmm. And CMS is again, where there is um, uh, cloud native technologies are being used. Uh, but currently both CMS and the backend uh, On-prem, they use RabbitMQ uh, and Service Bus, uh, .NET Core, um, RavenDB. You know uh, uh, those uh, those set of technologies. Okay, cool. Thanks. So, um, just moving on, uh, I wanted to show uh, the uh, kind of uh, advantage you get uh, if uh, once you uh, extract a service from a monolith. Um, so. The first service we extracted uh, is called, you know, it, uh, in, in our industry, it's called the rubric service, but just to simplify, 
um, um, uh, I'm calling it the scoring rule service. Um, so uh, before the service was extracted, the scoring rules were expressed as steps, you know, and, 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 and in this format that kind of resembles a low level language. Uh, so uh, in this example, the correct answer is if you had 10,000 in the debit column here and 10,000 in the credit column uh, over here. Uh, but it, as you can see, it takes around eight steps for the author to express the scoring rule. And again, in uh, you know less uh, uh, less readable format, you know you really have to uh, know the style of authoring the scoring rule in order to uh, be able to uh, uh, specify the rubric. Uh, so I was kind of reminded of uh, 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 this this quote from Eric Evans, uh, where uh, this would be an example of uh, software doing something very useful without explaining itself. You know. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of added that quote uh, for that reason over here. Um, so once the service was extracted, uh, we had a smaller boundary. And uh, the fact that you have a smaller boundary, it allows for a more expressive model to emerge. And now the scoring rules can be offered in a very human readable format. Uh, now you can simply assert specific values uh, in the debit and credit columns without having to write that many steps. And uh, since this was a separate boundary, we were also able to use uh, a NoSQL database so that you know persistence could be frictionless. And these are the kind of things you couldn't do as part of being in inside a monolith. Got it. Got it. That's very interesting. And I guess that uh, that uh, allows me to ask the, the, the another question. That is, what were the challenges the team you and the team faced uh, in? Uh, applying uh, these, these SOA principles. And I mean, uh, I guess that uh, my question is, was, for example, finding service boundaries the problem, even if uh, I imagine that uh, everyone in the team uh, masters <laughs> the entire domain? Yeah, actually, uh, so uh, I, I think it, uh, you could say it, it has been a multi-year kind of an initiative. Uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and uh, the first few years is to just get um, the idea socialized, you know, uh, in a way that the team is on board, you know. So uh, um, uh, we had challenges in terms of getting um, uh, business buy-in. Even though we have an excellent product team, uh, we rightly needed to show them that we were not further complicating the system. Uh, to that end, uh, we uh, had also arranged for an external review of our code base and our SUA proposal uh, by Paul Rayner, who, you know, as you probably know, He's one of the leading voices in the domain-driven design community. Um, getting developer buy-in was also challenging, uh, but uh, we have a, you know, a strong culture of continuous learning uh, where we spend at least an hour a week uh, getting together, either learning a new topic or looking at the existing systems and so on. So slowly and surely we were able to get the dev team on board uh, as well. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, uh, doing the work is um, uh, obviously challenging, uh, and and more so with uh, ADSD because you know with um, um, so I had a lot of background in domain driven design, and uh, you know with with the uh, DDD tactical patterns, you can um, find uh, so many uh, reference architectures. I think that uh, the cargo and shipping example. Uh, has probably been replicated in every programming language uh, that is uh, that exists today. Uh, so it was a little difficult to find a, a reference architecture for ADSD, uh, but we did trust uh, our team's collective background in design, and uh, we engaged you, Moro, to help us um, during the implementation. So um, uh, Moro used to spend, uh, I think, a couple of hours with us. Uh, every week while we were implementing, uh, and we got a lot of uh, you know uh, helpful guidance from you um, uh, uh, from that perspective. Thanks. So the so we one of the things we we provide is the ADSD course, Advanced Distributed System Design course, and uh, currently the free Distributed System Design Fundamentals course. Have you? or your team uh, done any of the two? And if yes, was it helpful in facing the mentioned challenges? Yes, I think the ADSD course was uh, really, really, really helpful because uh, I, you know, I, I, I've watched a lot of Udi's presentations over the years uh, and it uh, uh, did help uh, you know, connect a lot of these concepts together that he was talking about. 
Uh, by the time we uh, attended the course, we had already extracted the first, uh, like you, you can say, bounded context, the scoring rule service out of the monolith. However, we were having significant issues uh, even imagining how composite UI would work. Uh, and so um, um, uh, the, uh, when we went to the course and we learned about these uh, technical services like IT ops and branding, uh, that actually helped us not only with composite UI, it also helped us uh, eliminate a lot of the data duplication that, uh, uh, that issue that we were facing. Uh, and um, so our architects attended the course and uh, another benefit of uh, having them attend the course was it was easier to bring the rest of the uh, team along. Yeah, that's an interesting point because one of the things I learned uh, over the years uh, in helping uh, organizations like yours uh, is that uh, the, the buy-in uh, is one of the most biggest challenge. So you have to build trust uh, into the new architectural design and choices and, uh, and technology and slowly bring people on board. And uh, that's one of the, the, the challenge. Uh, and using uh, <coughs> courses, uh, it's very helpful in that case. So the, going back a bit again uh, to technology, we see a lot of developers uh, uh, having the mindset of recreating the web. So write your own data access layer, write your own logging, write your own messaging systems. And then uh, there are some others that use the bare SDK. So for example, they are on Azure in the cloud, they want to use the Azure service bus and they just use the Azure client SDK that shipped by Microsoft. And uh, why did you end up choosing N service bus instead of rolling your own solution or solely relying on the SDKs provided by the cloud vendors in this case? Yeah, so I think so. If, if you just look at our history, you know, so we uh, started with MSMQ, uh, uh, and and MSMQ is a very very elegant piece of technology. Uh, we didn't think we were ever going to move away from MSMQ, uh, and then uh, along came .NET Core, uh, and there's no support for distributed transactions, and so uh, we had to kind of switch to RabbitMQ. Uh, and and uh, as we were doing the cloud migration, we kind of had a similar experience where uh, we thought. Uh, Azure storage queues were really inexpensive and maybe better than you know using Azure Service Bus. And again, we started with uh, storage queues and we had to switch to um, uh, the Service Bus. And all of this was really possible because we were sitting behind an end Service Bus uh, abstraction. Uh, otherwise, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, um, uh, especially these transport technologies, uh, they offer very different delivery guarantees. So you cannot even just you know take you build a code once and just copy it and apply it to one to the other one. Um, so um, uh, from that perspective, and service bus was a big help. Uh, the and service bus also implements a lot of messaging design patterns like sagas, uh, process managers, outboxing, which gives you exactly once delivery uh, guarantee. Uh, and even within sagas, you know, you, you can reply back to a message or you can reply back to the originator. Uh, I think these are uh, uh, extremely sophisticated uh, behaviors to implement on your own. Um, so if you do end up spending a lot of time writing infrastructure code, I think uh, you have to realize that that is time that you are not spending writing business logic. You know, And, and I think um, basically that's really what you want to do. You want to solve uh, problems for the business rather than uh, you know, uh, write plumbing code. Um, and um, so I, I think it's, it's best to kind of uh, source infrastructure code from the community. And uh, you know, sometimes even the community has a, a hard time keeping up. Uh, so Log4Net, which is the most dominant library uh, for, uh, in, in .NET for logging, they don't have uh, support for structured logging yet. Yeah. Uh, so they're still working on it. You know? So uh, it is, you know, I think, um, uh, you're writing business applications and that's what you want to do uh, most of your time um, rather than, uh, you know, uh, write infrastructure code. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, uh, yeah. Mara, you also asked me uh, uh, earlier a question about uh, finding service boundaries. Oh, yes, yes, that's, you're right. That's, uh, uh, it, it's an interesting one for uh, a lot of folks who want to uh, hear about it. Um, so, um, uh, I think a few minutes to try and uh, at least discuss what we did. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so Udi's approach is is really helpful, uh, where uh, he would say, 
Um, and so, again, like uh, Udi says that there is no one right way to find service boundaries, but there are rules of thumb. Uh, but this one really helped us uh, where you take an entity and you slice it into properties that uh, will participate in a transaction and properties that will never participate in a transaction. So here you have, you know, um, uh, uh, you, you have properties that are more cohesive uh, and loosely coupled from others, you know. So that's a, that's a good rule of thumb to follow. Uh, for uh, someone uh, like me who comes from a domain driven design background, uh, I think um, uh, I also pay attention to language. Uh, so, for example, in the context of uh, questions, an item has those exhibits and response fields, um, uh, you know, uh, and, and whereas when it comes to scoring, uh, an item has measurement opportunities, keys, and assertions. So it's clearly separate language being used, which is indicative of a separate bounded context. Or a separate service um, um, in that sense. Uh, other uh, techniques that we used were, uh, you know, we um, uh, obviously our system had grown to be uh, hundreds of, you know, uh, relational tables uh, in the database. Uh, and so we also looked at the tables that had more connections in between them. And so they are likely to be more cohesive. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think uh, what, what Udi says, uh, about share nothing, you can only share IDs between services. That is uh, critical to uh, uh, ending up with uh, extremely crisp uh, service boundaries, you know? Uh, so uh, for example, the data duplication uh, issue that I was referring to earlier, um, um, you know, I, I think following uh, this, this specific rule would mean that the one service would be forced to own the entire feature of adaptive routing, including the schema uh, and including the logic. So uh, all of these were uh, very helpful um, uh, when, when we were trying to find service boundaries. Yeah, yeah. And, and we get back to the data duplication thing and splitting uh, entities, looking at the single properties and grouping things uh, uh, based on what changes together, stays together in a, in a second because it uh, makes me think to an interesting question. But before moving to that, uh, um, le le let's talk about the technology once again. What particular problems uh, and service bus uh, doesn't service bus uh, solve for you? Solve for you. Okay, so I think for this, 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 uh, um, I'll, I'll share my screen again. So um, uh, we basically use uh, and service bus for uh, message handling uh, uh, for uh, as process managers uh, as well as to organize business logic. So. I don't really think you need to see an example of a message handler, uh, but we can discuss uh, process manager a little bit. Uh, so uh, I like how uh, CQRS journey explains the pattern. So uh, the use case here at this diagram is um, uh, that there is this customer who is trying to uh, reserve seats uh, for a conference. And in this kind of before implementation, uh, you can see that multiple aggregates need to interact in order to complete the transaction. Uh, so the customer places the order and the order aggregate sends a command to make a reservation. And eventually the order aggregate sends another command to make the payment. Uh, so you can see that it is doing a little bit too much, you know? Yeah. And so when you have um, uh, something like a process manager in the middle, uh, the um, uh, order aggregate no longer needs to know what is the uh, next step in the process. Uh, and so, uh, the process manager receives the order created event, then it sends a command to make a reservation, uh, and then it sends another command to eventually make a payment, you know? Uh, so um, as we've been uh, in this, in this uh, kind of um, uh, discussion, as we've been going through examples, I'll give you an example that, uh, you know, uh, of, of a process manager that we've implemented. Uh, so it's a very straightforward one. Just uh, if you think of it, uh, we are batch importing items from a third party. So uh, uh, the way we implement it uh, here is we, impl uh, we import one item at a time. And when that item says it's complete, we import the next set of, an, uh, of uh, the next uh, item. Uh, however, um, um, uh, the, when the item import command is sent, it is actually um, storing the data in multiple services. So multiple services have to confirm that the data is stored uh, before you uh, receive the import completed message. Uh, and so um, um, uh, with, with, this, with this pattern, you even have more granular uh, control over the import of each item. 
Uh, and so uh, it also helps to engage uh, domain experts in case you have to discuss compensating actions. Um, so um, in our case, uh, if there is a file that has, um, you know, let's say 100 items to be imported and 99 of them worked fine, what do we do with the last one item? You don't want to throw away, you don't want to make it a, a, a you know, all or nothing transaction. Yeah. You just want to see what to do with the uh, one item that failed. Uh, and the compensating action that we decided it was to put the item in an inactive status from an inventory service perspective. Once that happens, it's really kind of not visible to the rest of the uh, system. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the process manager is, is really it's treating uh, business process as a first class citizen, you know, that way it's really uh, helpful. We've also uh, used uh, sagas um, uh, to implement what uh, Uri calls a domain model. Uh, so unlike the process manager that uh, manages process state, uh, here you are actually doing business logic. Yeah. Uh, so for a low stakes exam, uh, we do percent correct scoring. Uh, and you can see that, you know, uh, the actual scoring happens somewhere else. Uh, and uh, this is the, for that score order, uh, here you are sending the candidate how many uh, answers they got correct, you know, using the percent uh, scoring uh, policy. Uh, so this has its own set of advantages. I think you'll be able to see it uh, uh, very clearly when I show you the next slide, uh, where we have a service where all, do, all the domain logic is organized as sagas. Mm -hmm. So our Cisco service has um, um, uh, all domain logic as sagas. Uh, and uh, uh, what you also see in this case uh, is that there aren't too many architectural layers uh, because N-Service Bus uh, takes care of um, uh, persistence, retrieval of sagas, and also it provides, you know, the consistency and competency boundary uh, that, you know, uh, that an aggregate is really used for. Um, so we've implemented kind of uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, N-Service Bus extensively from uh, you know, basic message handling, uh, command handling or event handling, the process manager uh, to using it as a domain model. Oh, that's very interesting. And I do really like a lot the sagas as aggregates uh, pattern because it's a way to encapsulate uh, and protect the, the, the domain model from a certain interaction because essentially the only way to get to that aggregate is by using comments or events yes. or messages in general. So in that yes. case, it's it's a sort of a very strict uh, hexagonal architecture kind of implementation where the, the ports and adapters are just messages and the, the core domain is protected inside the saga. So that's, uh, that's very nice. So let's go back for a second to the, um, uh, to the, the data problem. So we, 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 you said that uh, obviously when, when finding service boundaries, uh, you'll end up uh, splitting what's, uh, what's an entity from the user mental model perspective, let's say a product, and look at single attributes or properties on that entity. And then you'll find you realizing that, oh, but this one belongs to service A and this other one belongs to service B. And so now the product is split into two different services, but obviously, I, as a user, I don't want to see price on, and uh, description on two different pages or my name and the score of the exam on another page. I just want to view my exam results. So I guess that, that, that that's, that's a technical challenge that, uh, how do you face that and solve the problem? Um, so I think uh, it, it depends on kind of the, uh, uh, um, um, so uh, let's say, uh, generally speaking, you know, they, you will assign uh, one service uh, uh, as the, uh, you know, that, that creates that entity. Let's say, for example, in, um, uh, in our domain, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, in the CMS system, the authors want to create an item. The first thing that they want to do is they want to start, um, um, you know, adding content uh, to an item. Uh, so uh, in our question service, uh, you know, it, it just raises an event that, you know, I created a question item. Uh, and so what happens is the other services are listening to that message and the rubric service will say, okay, you know, I, I know that an item was created. Uh, I'm going to, you know, create a shell of an item on my side. And over here, we will eventually have measurement opportunities and, you know, uh, keys and assertions as same happens on the inventory service side, it says, okay, this item is in an initial state at this point and so on. 
So uh, uh, basically, it's you know uh, the uh, the uh, item uh, gets uh, created one place, and then um, uh, other services um, uh, subscribe to the event, uh, do the work, and then uh, obviously, then you have to show everything on the same page. You have uh, to use composite UI uh, techniques. Um, so they are again extremely interesting, and they're actually not very difficult to implement. Um, so. Um, uh, if you want, I can show you an example of a uh, composite one. Uh, but in this case, it's not a single entity uh, mm -hmm. split into multiple, but it is still data that is coming from multiple services. Uh, so let me uh, let me go to that part uh, of the um, uh, slides. So um, uh, so this is um, an actual exam. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, this is a candidate who has taken a break. Uh, they attempted the first set of questions, and now they are on a break. Uh, on this break page, uh, you see uh, two. Uh, you see data that is coming from two different services. So the test at Compass tells the candidate that you finished the first set of questions, and these many are remaining. Uh, whereas this is just you know content that instructional content that the candidates need to see when they are on a break um, uh, page. So mm -hmm. this comes from the assessment service, whereas this comes from the delivery service, and so. Uh, I've uh, laid the intersection side by side. Um, and so on the left hand side, uh, just take a um, uh, pay attention to the namespace, uh, it's assessments, and on the right hand side, it's delivery. So mm -hmm. these were actually uh, NuGet packages uh, or, or components that were uh, built in two separate services deployed to the same system. And they're both intercepting the uh, brake controller and the get method in the brake controller. And so um, uh, uh, delivery is doing that. Uh, assessments is also doing that. You know, it, uh, it's uh, um, intercepting break and the get method. And the assessment service in the view model that goes down to the client, it puts the test and compass information. Mm -hmm. And um, the um, uh, delivery service puts the break uh, content uh, information in there. And we do a reverse operation on the client. Uh, so uh, if you look at the client, um, uh, they are, uh, you know, they are both intercepting the response from the same URL. So you'll see, uh, you'll see the same uh, happening here. Uh, they are both uh, intercepting the break get. And when the response comes back, uh, the uh, assessment service takes uh, the tested compass uh, uh, from the view model, and the delivery service takes the break content from um, uh, the view model. And that's how we kind of make uh, composite UI work. Oh, that's um, very, yeah, yeah, that's very cool. So let me try to see if I understood the frame correctly. So essentially, the the, the first uh, the first part of the code that we saw, the one the C sharp one, is a sort of a reverse proxy, right? So it intercepts uh, an HTTP request essentially, yeah. that, and then it splits that request uh, onto those two handlers. Uh, that are coming from different services. And now those two handlers, given that they logically belong to two different services, they can access different data in a single request and compose those data that get that returned back to the client. And on the client, it happens the opposite process. So two different components in this case in Angular, they can extract from the HTTP response their own set of data, ignoring everything else because they just don't, don't know what it is, and then do whatever they need to do with the they, their own part of the result. Yeah, and I, I think again, just to uh, we have to credit you, uh, Mauro, for uh, this the initial framework. I think you uh, have it uh, um, uh, in your uh, uh, GitHub repository also. So we took that and then we you know kind of um, uh, productionized it to fit our needs. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I think uh, it, it works really well. It is not as complicated as uh, you know uh, you would think uh, uh, it would be, um, and you know it just works for us really well. Um, I, I wanted to show you something else uh, interesting on the uh, client side. Um, so uh, we uh, have uh, you know a messaging service on the client side, and the handlers uh, are very end service plus style. So. Hmm. Uh, um, let me just show it to you over here. Uh, here, uh, this is this is just TypeScript, and it is intercepting the map and store item command, and it even has the is correlated by oh, nice. uh, uh, method, and then it does uh, whatever it needs to uh, do in terms of handling it. Um, so I think we had to do a little bit of uh, you know um, uh, work on the um, UI composition side, uh, hmm. but 
it is really worth the effort in, in terms of eliminating a lot of the uh, duplication, uh, unnecessary duplication uh, of data across you know, systems. Multiple services. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me ask um, the final question. If I recall correctly, uh, you're also using uh, on Azure, Azure Functions, right? Is there any specific use case you're using Azure Functions for, or you're using Azure Functions in general uh, when deploying uh, to the cloud? Um, so uh, I think uh, um, uh, Uli talks about uh, um, uh, uh, an autonomous component as uh, independently deployable. Uh, and so uh, our uh, ACs or autonomous components, uh, you know, um, for a system like driver that works in a test center in a VM, uh, they are uh, NuGet packages that we deploy. Uh, whereas uh, when now that we're working with a cloud native um, uh, approach, um, each aggregate can be deployed as a function. Uh, um, so uh, we actually have, uh, that's, that's the approach that we are currently using. Uh, we are, you know, uh, using functions as the deployment unit. Oh, nice, nice. That's very interesting. And that's one of the use cases where I see the, the serverless world very, very handy. Okay, so we have a question from uh, one of the attendees, Stefan. And he's asking, so in the case you mentioned with the import of items where multiple services have to confirm the item is imported, how does the process manager determine all parts have succeeded? Uh, for example, how does it know all services have actually done its job without introducing coupling? Um, so uh, um, um, I think so you, you, um, the, uh, the, the level of abstraction that the import is sitting at this, you know, if, if, if um, it's, it's really, um, the import is not really, it's, it's an IT ops kind of a function, you know, like I want to pump data into the system. Uh, and so uh, when it is doing that, um, uh, you know, uh, there um, uh, and, and uh, multiple services are intercepting uh, that, um, um, uh, that command uh, and saying that they are done, uh, it's really they're replying back to, uh, you know, wherever the request came from, you know, so uh, the IT ops, all it's, all it's doing is it's saying, well, have you services finished what you were supposed to do, you know, so um, um, uh, in, in that case, uh, that wouldn't be the role of IT ops, you know, it is, it is, it's not doing something inappropriate um, um, uh, when you're talking about um, sending kind of a composed document through the system. It's yeah. verifying that the composed document did end up in the system. Yeah, yeah. so it's like saying uh, the, the, the import process manager loads uh, a blob of data, which it knows nothing about. It, it just yeah. knows that it's a set of rows uh, and the yeah. scheme of the rows is unknown to the import uh, process manager. And then mm -hmm. essentially publishes a sort of an event saying, Hey folks, import data, import yes. row ID one, two, three, four, five, yeah. whatever. And then it simply waits for replies as imported row one, imported yeah. row two. And it doesn't really know, it doesn't really need to know what was the job done by the importers and uh, how many steps required uh, importing that specific row, because it just needs to know someone later in time will reply me imported. And that's yeah. the, the thing, yeah. Which is interesting because it opens up also the possibility of saying uh, there is a there's, there's a pipeline of import of or uh, let's say translators. So you can have a sort of a mechanism where you can dynamically load uh, implementation of importers from different services in the IT ops uh, thing, and they and simply blindly invoke them and say, okay, do your own job, and then when it's finished, I'm done. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and, and Stefan comments that when you said uh, IT ops, I understood. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> we answered the question. So I think that uh, if there are no more questions, it's, uh, it's, we're done. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. That was an incredible pleasure to have you with us today. And back to you, Han. Likewise, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, you know, uh, discuss the work that we've done for the last many years. You know, it, it's, yeah. it takes a long time to see something like this through.
Thanks, Neil, and thanks, Mauro. It's, uh, that was very interesting. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for being here with us today. Uh, uh, the uh, recorded uh, webinar will be shared with you and with everyone, anyone that, uh, that could not attend uh, uh, this morning or this time. And uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one.